Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our first session of the final day of the YES uh, conference and speaker series. The second time this week, uh, we're joined by Berkeley Poole, who very graciously agreed to come back as we had some technical glitches earlier in the week. Uh, we were all on the edge of our seat with the brilliance of her talk on self-advocacy and resilience. So thank you for coming back, Berkeley. Before we get started with Berkeley's presentation, we wanted to acknowledge the land on which George Brown College is situated is a traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation and other indigenous peoples who have lived on this land. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community and on this territory. Across the School of Design, we remain committed to identifying and removing systemic barriers to accessing college programs and services, and are committed to identifying strategies, tools, and actions to better support our Indigenous student population. In a commitment to build connections and opportunities for students to engage with design's visionaries, YES, is a, yes features a week-long lecture series, 18 to be exact. The design-focused speaker series has been cultivated in an effort to provide dynamic perspectives and unique discussion opportunities for members of our community, including students and faculty alike. Honest advice for designers from really good designers connects the School of Design with those who have, been, those who have impacted the industry on a local and a global scale. We encourage you to ask any questions you have for Berkeley in the YouTube chat. With that, I'm happy to introduce Berkeley Poole, who has over 10 years of creative direction and design experience with a focus on large-scale brand development. Currently, she is the creative director at Whitman Emerson, a Toronto-based strategy-driven design studio. She built a portfolio of iconic cannabis brands at Tokyo Smoke as VP and creative director. She also held roles at Barney's New York, Laird & Partners, V Magazine, and Visionaire, working on brands ranging from Karl Lagerfeld to Calvin Klein, Ace Hill to Essence. Moderating the Q&A portion of today's session is de design management graduate Janine Guac. Janine is a graphic designer, creative director, design manager, and business owner. She holds a degree in design from OCAD University, where she was awarded the Project 31 Award for her achievements in illustration and design. In the design management program at the School of Design, she developed her major project, which is now a fully functioning non-for-profit business. Auto is a socially charged community-based platform to relieve stress and isolation among others among users with the ability to manage and track symptoms, allowing users to feel in control of their health while connecting those who experience similar symptoms. Otto recently placed runner up at the George Brown College Pitch It competition for social innovation. Janine has always believed in using her passion for design as a way to help others, to find solutions, make connections and create work that is both inspiring and brings joy. Welcome Janine. With that, I'm pleased to turn it over to Berkeley. We'll start her presentation. I'm sending you good tech vibes, Berkeley. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed, it all goes smoothly, but we'll just roll with it. Um, so today I'm here to talk about self-advocacy and resilience in design. And, you know, this is largely inspired by a lot of the learnings I've had in my own career. Um, so we're going to go through some of the chronology of my work experiences, because ultimately where I felt I struggled the most, but also learned the most was like on the more emotional and financial side of my work experiences and navigating political workspaces, advocating um, for my salary, advocating for the rate that I deserve. So we're gonna go through some of the tools and strategies I learned along the way. So first off, why design? And I mean, this is a question we should all ask ourselves when embarking on this career. And, you know, for me, design was really alluring because there was like this very technical aspect to it, a very cerebral aspect as well. Um, but it was also very much a career where I could pour my passion into it and pour my, um, incorporate all of my interests as a person into it. And I was largely inspired by my parents who owned a photo studio in Toronto and just seeing the energy that they had on set, um, the collaboration that would happen. And it just looked like a fun, sparky environment. And that was very much something I wanted for myself. So one of the first roles I had was at V Magazine and V is based in New York. And so when this opportunity came up, I did all of my homework so I could get this job. I researched many of the back issues, the contributors, um, the uh, subjects, and I also did multiple rounds of design tests, multiple interviews, and then ultimately got the job. So V was this like super glamorous boundary pushing place in that I got to work with top tier photographers. You had, um, 
Gigi Hadid just like drop by the office casually, uh, Sierra come by the office. And you also were learning so much about the leading edge of arts, culture, fashion, music. Also got to go to really cool parties. So um, like the Lady Gaga art rave. So that was really fun. But it was this really fast paced environment as well where you learned a lot about type and editorial design and the finer points of those things. And I had also designed this custom typeface while I was there. And simultaneously worked on Visionaire. And Visionaire is a really cool publication everyone should check out. Um, very experimental in that it's a different format every issue. So on the left, we have the scent issue. In the middle is the lenticular issue. And on the right is the metal issue. But unfortunately, the um, workplace culture was actually quite toxic at V. I mean, many of us have probably seen the movie The Devil Wears Prada, and you know those things are largely inspired by real life. And unfortunately, the editor at V, Stephen Gann, you know, on the daily would have like these racist and misogynistic comments for the magazine subjects, the people on staff. And there was also just like this very, I mean, now I think it's not so prevalent in fashion, but this culture where it was okay to be really shallow and judgmental and cruel. And I mean, I had my own art director commenting on my weight and like ridiculing me for being a size 26. And ultimately when you have that kind of environment um, and one where there's so much fear and intimidation, people feel really afraid to share creative ideas and afraid to speak up in brainstorms. But that leads me to my first lesson, which is to turn the L into a learning. And, you know, looking back, I think about what that experience gave me. And I think it taught me so much about the kind of manager I want to be going forward. And how important empathy is and how vulnerable you feel, especially at the start of your career and how anyone in a role, um, in a position of power that really needs to have that compassion and awareness for people in those positions. And ultimately a culture of competition, fear, overwork, scarcity is not what helps people thrive and especially not creatives. People ultimately need safety and inspiration in order to do great work. And so during that time, I mean, as you can see, I started to become very disenchanted with how superficial and vacuous fashion was. And uh, similarly, my friend Sarah Nicole Prickett, who is a writer in the fashion space, felt very similar things. And so we started Adult Magazine. And Adult is a literary erotic magazine. And we started this magazine as a passion project because for a subject like sex, we couldn't understand why it was so taboo and stigmatized when it's so every day. And so I did the creative direction and design of the magazine and we self published the magazine together. But ultimately nothing was off limits and we just wanted to explore and show eroticism the way that we knew it. And so that was um, hosting a multiplicity of perspectives, making sexuality more intersectional, um, also having you know, interviews with Satanists, psychics. Uh, we had a photo essay on masturbation. And it was just like really thrilling to just start to see this reaction in the world and see that it resonated with people because ultimately it just, like I said, felt like a passion project that was so intimate and personal to us. And so we did a takeover with Days Magazine on their website. We had a feature in the New York Times. We um, also did a talk at the MoMA. And so ultimately it was just this little passion project where we created this environment where it was just like all of the things we wanted to see in the world. And that was more diverse casting, better pay for contributors for an editorial magazine. Which leads me to my next idea and that's doubt kills dreams. And you know, we had so many people ask us over the years like how we were able to do it, how we were able to self publish and put this magazine out there um, as if there was some kind of like secret as to how to pull this all together. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's just this application of grit and hard work and passion that really helps you to see these things through. And I think that's what ultimately overshadowed a lot of those like self limiting 
feelings and like feelings of imposter syndrome that we all have. Um, it's just kind of about pushing through and trying. And I mean, ultimately, I think you can't have this fear of failure either because you are going to fail in some aspects. You're going to stumble along the way. I mean, we certainly did, especially on the business and financial side of things. Um, but that's also just where you learn and you grow. And so um, while I was working in New York, I also took on some freelance projects because I guess I just had a very like self-punishing work ethic. Um, but one of my clients was for this craft beer brand. And as you can see here, when I was initially approached by this brand and it was in the running against a few other Toronto design studios, I mean, this is what the craft beer landscape looked like. It was very much this like heritage-y look and feel, um, wood block type illustrations. And part of my pitch to them was that I was going to apply design thinking and I was going to approach it much differently than other studios would. And so this is the design of the first can for Ace Hill that I did. And ultimately, you know, I was thinking about how it would be really bold and iconic and stand out, whether it was in hand or on shelf. And I think that was like a big part of the appeal for its audience. And it really helped them transcend the beer category in that regard. And that's how they were able to do all these other SKUs like, um, ready to drink RTDs, you know, the Rattlers, the vodka sodas, things like that. I provided them with a design system that was consistent and bold enough with this like really striking design, but also flexible and scalable enough that they could really grow. Uh, which leads me to this idea of knowing your worth. And ultimately, I think this is something that we hear a lot in our culture. And I think that oftentimes the messaging kind of stops there. Um, so I think it's really important that you research your worth. And in, when you're going into salary negotiations or when you're negotiating your rate, it's really about arming yourself with the figures and having that financial literacy. So you know what the industry standard is. You've talked to mentors and other knowledgeable people on um, what kind of pay structures might be options. You know, for Ace Hill and I think for similar projects like this where, you know, they have like a really solid team in-house and the potential to really grow as a brand, it might be an idea to negotiate for part pay and stock options. Um, oftentimes I think like women and people of color especially don't exercise a lot of transparency around pay and rates because they feel a shame and a stigma about it. Um, but I think this is something that we just have to let go of in order to really advance in our careers. And so next we have my experience at Barney's and at Barney's I was the art director. And this was a really enriching experience in that Barney's was this very um, historic brand with a lot of prestige, but they also did these really cool collaborations. And so it had this really malleable and experimental feeling in that, you know, the same place is having these hood by air windows with these like very visceral and jarring lifelike recreations of the models from the Paris runway. And then, you know, in the next couple of months, they would have this ad campaign with Baz Luhrmann for the holiday campaign. And Baz Luhrmann uh, directs movies like Moulin Rouge and The Great Gatsby. And so it has this like very fantastical and larger than life feeling. And then these are some of the uh, typographic designs I had done and editorial layouts I had done. And they just have this like very playful experimental approach. And that was largely informed um, by my mentor and boss, Edward Leda. I mean, he's a type God in and of his own right. And he just really taught me to be iterative in the creative process. And I think oftentimes, especially with young designers, you can be so fixated on like thinking about the end results and trying to make something good that you actually stifle yourself in the journey and in the process. Um, and so he really helped me be more unencumbered by that. And I think this is a really critical lesson and that's to seek mentors. And especially for any job or role you're considering, 
you really want to look at the people, I think even more so the environment, and you want to really look for someone who will be that teacher to you and help you learn and grow and be invested in you as a person. And when I met Eddie, I mean, he poached me for this job at Barney's. I'd actually just started another ad agency, I think, and I was like three months into it. Um, so I wasn't really looking for another role, but ultimately his skills were so aspirational in terms of like his thinking and his designs. Um, but it was also clear to me that he was just a very kind person, a very thoughtful person that was very much invested in his team. And so he really taught me how to advocate for myself as well on the financial side of things um, in terms of my salary or even my office at Barney's. And so someone who was like invested in helping me build my confidence professionally was really um, advantageous as well. So you're probably seeing all this and you're just like, okay, well, why would she move back to Toronto if it's like so glamorous and there are all of these like cool parties and kind of like celebrities and top photographers and things like that. But ultimately the grind and the hustle of New York um, really started to wear on me. And I was also just burnt out in terms of like the work culture and working crazy long days and weekends. And so I think there's just like a real maturity in knowing when, you know, you've just kind of had too much of a, a certain situation as well. And so soon after moving back, I actually met Alan Gertner and Alan is the founder of Tokyo Smoke. And it was wild because that was like well before legalization and he just had this one cafe um, and they sold coffee and cannabis paraphernalia, but he just had these huge aspirations of it being this massive brand, this huge retailer. And that really intrigued me. Um, I also saw it as this like raw opportunity to not only build a brand, but to also shape and influence an industry at large. And so for a subject as like gnarled and gross as this, ultimately all of the psychological and emotional risks that this posed for people really intrigued me. Um, but certainly, you know, this is like the association that my parents had and they thought that I was totally insane for going from working at Barney's to working in weed. Um, but there is just something in it still. I mean, for me, there was like creatively so much you could explore in terms of changing people's perceptions around it. And certainly this kind of like reefer madness ethos was something that was in the public consciousness for so long. Um, but I saw cannabis as something that did a lot of good for people. And I saw the, the spectrum of experience people could have with it as well. And I also just really looked at how I enjoyed it and what my relationship was like with it and how my friends enjoyed it. And it was very much about the set and the setting. So the mindset that you bring to the experience um, the feelings, the mood, the expectations that you have, that all really influences it. And then the setting being more like the mise-en-scene, the, the ritual that you enjoy, the vibe that you curate. And so like any good designer, I did my due diligence when it came to doing my research. And ultimately, while I um, appreciate the creativity and resourcefulness that my friends always had at house parties growing up, you know, making the gravity bongs, the apple bongs, the water bottle bongs, and just like the really ornate nature of a lot of like glassware in the cannabis paraphernalia space. As a designer, I was really thinking about how we could evolve the form and the function so the form so that these pieces were more aesthetically interesting and felt like less shameful to have in your home and the function so that they were easier to clean um, a more chill experience and less about getting totally zooted and so the first piece that i had designed with castor was the heirloom stack and i love this piece in that it is it looks like your grandmother's candy dish, but it's also a highly functional piece in that it's a four in one um, pipe storage grinder ashtray. It's also really easy to clean and 
the pipe is an ideal length so you don't singe your eyebrows when you um, go to light it. And there's just all of these thoughtful details in the design. Uh, which leads me into my next lesson or learning here, and that's to develop your POV. And, you know, I think oftentimes as designers, there's this perception that, you know, there isn't necessarily like artistry or there isn't uh, a personal element in your work. And I think that largely isn't true. Uh, I really weave my own experience into a brand. And I think that designers are really these cultural archaeologists that take bits of their life, these thoughts, these feelings, these experiences, and they weave that into the work. Um, and certainly as a woman and a person of color, I think that I also really know what it's like to exist both within a culture and just outside of it and really observe and study it. And I think that kind of vulnerability and sensitivity and awareness was something that I used to feel uh, really anxious about and, you know, feeling that otherness in a lot of ways, but it's actually really powerful when you can infuse it into your work. And so as I started to build out more of the visual language with the, of the brand, it was really about bringing in collaborators as well that could really help inform the vision of what it could be. And so working with people like Karan Singh um, on this Tokyo Smoke Holiday campaign, or artists like Dahe Song who did installations uh, at events and at the Queen Street store and also did designs for the rolling papers. And also was developing more of the photography for the brand. And I mean, the photography was its own unique challenge in a lot of ways because there was really restrictive federal regulations around what we could do and say. And I mean, there was just like so much you couldn't do or say in that you couldn't um, make anything too lifestyle. You couldn't make it too glam. You couldn't talk about the effects of cannabis. You couldn't show consumption, um, couldn't include animals and yeah, so I mean, with all of those things in place, it becomes like really tricky to sell and talk about cannabis when you can't talk about cannabis. And so the idea that I started to have here was like, let's just focus in more on what we actually can do and what we can show. And so we can show that cannabis can be a very natural part of your life and it can look really light and airy and inviting in your home. It can also look sexy and moody in a bedroom setting. And you can also use light and color and texture to make it more sensorial. And we can also highlight grow and cultivation methods so that they look more thoughtful and nuanced and less about this like kind of clinical hazmat suit look. And for the whole Renfrew Tokyo Smoke campaign, showing that cannabis can be more high end, but then still maintaining that element of like whimsy and weirdness because it's still weed and it's still fun. And so it's this idea I think that's really critical for creatives and especially designers is that you know, you shouldn't really exist in a silo and it's really important to build your community. And this was fundamental for me at Tokyo Smoke. I mean, especially in the early days um, when the creative team was still really small, it felt like I was the lone wolf in a lot of ways, just like in a culture where it was a lot of marketing and tech bros that had ideas that were very different than mine. Um, and it was such a new and volatile industry and there was no precedent for what cannabis branding or advertising looked like. And so ultimately I thought it was really important that we host a diversity of perspectives to really make the brand multifaceted and make it interesting. Um, and there's such this like invisible labor and emotional toll as well. Um, and when you're in an environment like that, and for me, being like the lone creative, one of very few people of color, one of not very many women, I really needed to build communities so that I could nourish and sustain my creative spirit. And next up, we have some of the campaigns that I developed for Tokyo Smoke. 
And so this first one is for the Tokyo smoke terpene world. And so again, there's so much we couldn't say about cannabis use and consumption and effects, but terpenes are the scent and flavor notes that are naturally occurring in cannabis. And the little little terpene has these lavender notes which make it more relaxing. So let's show people what that cannabis experience looks like through light, through the mist on the water, through the surreal and trippy nature of the landscape. So it just feels like this immersive world that you step into. Or for the capsule collection, uh, showing just how fun <laughs> these capsules are and how different they are from, you know, your regular Tylenols and Advils in that they are also odorless and smokeless. And so they're really clean and that's communicated through the color palette. Um, they're also very transportable, a buildable dose, and that's articulated through the animation and movement. And then when we were selling the various Tokyo smoke uh, strains and then showing and trying to emotionally convey what the experience of each of those is like, again, doing that with color and movement. And oftentimes, I mean, you know, we see the work now and I think it looks quite creative and boundary pushing and evocative and interesting, but what you don't see is just all of the struggle that transpired behind the scenes. Um, and ultimately cannabis as an industry was so chaotic and regulations were constantly shifting, but also highly restrictive. And like I said, there was no precedent for what we were doing. And oftentimes that's the, the challenge of being a creative. There's no quantifiable way to say that creative is right or wrong. Um, you don't have like the same metrics that you do for like a lot of marketing tactics. And so how do you still sell concepts through? How do you get alignment from the people on your team? How do you get the budgets that you need in order to do projects like this? And so I think it really comes back to this idea of trusting yourself because there's such a link between creativity and intuition. And it can be a very lonely path as a creative sometimes, um, especially when you're trying to do something new and different. And it's about connecting to this knowing inside yourself so you can see those concepts through. Um, and then ultimately, I mean, I think we all know what that feels like. It's that it's that feeling when a concept is really hitting or a feeling when there's a thread or an idea that you feel like you have to follow. So just kind of, you know, really connecting to that feeling and then also help rallying other people around that idea. Um, because I think that's critical as well. It's not about like defending concepts or just like a battle between you and them, but really bringing people into your vision, into the process and the journey. And so that brings me to my most recent role at Whitman Emerson. And when I was recruited to work at Whitman Emerson and I met with the two female founders, Whitney and Yasmin, I mean, it automatically felt kismet. It was a very, stark contrast to a lot of the environments I had operated in before, um, in that there was just such a level of thoughtfulness and intelligence and EQ that was both in the studio culture, but also in the work that they did. Um, very much this like strategy driven approach that's founded with a lot of research. Um, but then also just an example of, you know, two people and a whole studio that were really living their values in their work. And so the first project I'm sharing here is for Choice and Health Clinic. And Choice and Health is a nonprofit abortion clinic based in Toronto, and they also do advocacy work in the space. And so this was a hugely illuminating project for myself and the rest of the team because we just learned so much um, around the whole process and around the lack of access to abortions and abortion services and just the lack of awareness there was about around reproductive justice in general. So it necessitated making a visual identity system um, that was really sensitive and aware, but not too female skewing as well. Um, 
And then also just making a system that was very flexible and adaptive, especially given the changing conditions and work practices that they had and the challenges they were facing during COVID. And the last project I'll share is GEMS. And GEMS is a project I'm really excited and passionate about. It is a condom brand um, that is geared towards Gen Z. And the inspiration for this had come about, um, and this is actually a self-initiated project in-house at WE, um, but Whitney and Yasmin were in between pregnancies and went to the condom aisle and just found that, and I'm sure this is like something a lot of us have experienced, which is that, you know, a lot of the branding is certainly very um, 80s and it's aesthetic and just like kind of strange, but there's also a lot of or there's a lack of transparency around the actual ingredients in the product. And when you actually look into it deeper, a lot of these condoms actually contain products um, or ingredients that are quite toxic. And it just seemed like there was a real opportunity there to have a product that was more honest and transparent on the ingredient side, but also on the sex education side as well. Because a lot of the marketing you see in the space, especially the Trojans and the Durexes of the world, still very archaically reinforce these ideas of toxic masculinity. Um, but I think that there's just so mo much more that informs our experience of sex. And that's everything, political environment that we're operating in. Um, and certainly during COVID, there's a lot that people are reflecting on and trying to understand and navigate through their own relationship to sex and their ideas of love and communication and care and boundaries. So these are a lot of the things that we're exploring with the GEMS brand. And that leads me to my last lesson, which is to practice radical self-care. And I mean, this is a lesson I feel like I've been learning throughout my whole career and I'm continuing to learn. Um, but ultimately it's this idea that self-care isn't selfish and it's really our responsibility to take care of ourselves and make sure that we have a good foundation for our potential and our creative energy before we take care of others, before we're investing all of our energy and our passion into our work. Um, because ultimately, if we're not doing this for ourselves, we're doing a disservice to others. And so it's this idea of operating from like a more abundant place and having good health, good habits just for your body, mind and spirit. And I mean, it can sound really common sensey, but somehow it's not and it's not for a lot of designers. So looking back at some of the, the learnings I've had throughout my career, I mean, I think that success used to be really about like proving myself, especially proving myself in my otherness, being ambitious, um, being financially successful, and success really means something different to me now. It's more about nourishing and sustaining my creative energy and it's also really about finding a way to live my ethics and my values in my work, because I think that can be one of our most powerful tools as a designer. And now we'll open it up for questions. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, I think we have lost someone. Oh, yeah, just hi. give it a second. You probably accidentally closed the box. There we go. <laughs> I was like, it's awesome. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Berkeley, for the, that amazing uh, presentation. Um, such a wonderful talk, very inspirational. Um, I'm sure everyone's eager to ask their questions and advice about your journey in design. Um, I have some questions prepared today, and we'll also be taking some audience questions as well. So, anyone watching, feel free to comment um, in the box below and um, yeah, feel free to write your questions. We can get our best at getting to them. Okay, so my first question is after seeing your presentation and being familiar with your body of work, um, what would you say has been the biggest milestone in your career so far? Oh, good question. Biggest milestone. I mean, um, I think in a lot of ways, Tokyo Smoke was because that was, 
one of the the largest experiences I had in terms of like really building a brand from scratch um, that just became so massive. Like when I first started at Tokyo Smoke, I was the sole creative director and designer. Um, so oh. that was a challenging time. <laughs> and then when I left, I oversaw a team of over 20 people. Um, so it was just rapid growth. And I think I just learned a lot as a creative in terms of you know, how to sell concepts, how to really manage budgets, things like that. Um, but I learned a lot, you know, on the personal side as well. And I kind of touched on that in terms of like, ensuring that my cup wasn't empty. Um, and I wasn't like totally burning out and just like giving all of myself to my job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you also talk about uh, research that you did um, before you went into uh, interview for V Magazine. Mm -hmm. I was curious to know, like, what kind of research did you do for that? So in terms of like, was it networking? Was it like, what, what kind of research was that? Right. Yeah. And so this is actually so important. And it should be, again, like kind of a common sense thing to just like really research um when you're going in for any kind of interview but i researched each person that was interviewing me i researched the people that were on the masthead of the magazine so the editor's background the art director's background um i looked at back issues i researched the careers of like a lot of the contributing photographers so i could get a sense of like what the style was like what their body of work was like um and then i had rehauled my portfolio also in that process to like get ready and kind of tailor it to their tastes and you know show more type design show more editorial and fashion branding um because ultimately i think you just always want to make your portfolio a little bit more tailored to who you're sharing it with yeah yeah for sure i find that you want to go for if you're going to try for a certain you'll probably make it you know towards that that they're looking for instead of just having the set portfolio and mm -hmm. kind of including pieces that, you know, you want to be working on, not the ones that you've done. Mm -hmm. um, you also talk about the importance of a mentor. And I agree, like, I think a mentor is so important because I feel like as when we're starting out, we have so many questions and, you know, we're looking for answers. So how, what advice would you give to students on looking for the right mentor and where to look for that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like someone whose body of work you find very inspiring and aspirational and, I think when looking for a mentor or even when I'm looking for someone to hire, I'm always looking more at how someone's at how someone thinks, you know, because I think that's ultimately the most interesting part of anyone's work. It's not so much like, are they kind of just like following recent trends and, you know, using the coolest typefaces. It's just like, what is their conceptual journey really like in their work? Because that's what I think I find the most interesting and inspiring. Uh, I don't know if there's, I don't see any questions from the chat, so I'm going to keep um, asking my questions for now. <laughs> um, what advice, yeah, so I find that being a recent graduate, I'm saying to yes to almost every project that comes my way, even if it's, you know, sometimes I don't necessarily want to take it on. Um, what advice would you give to designers that are perhaps in the same position starting out where there's really not that much work and um, we're kind of saying yes to everything? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really tricky one because I think in a lot of ways, especially earlier on in your career, it is about doing a lot so that you can just kind of like learn what works, what doesn't, um, what you liked, what you didn't, because there's been some projects that I got into where like wasn't necessarily so keen at the start, but then ultimately um, we're still enriching work experiences. But again, I think when you're taking on all these different projects, it's really important to look at the people that you're working with, you know, and do their ethics align with yours. And it may, may not be like, um, like project wise, the kind of like client or industry that you found the most interesting, but like, is that person appreciative of your time and talent? Um, is there a good back and forth when you're talking about client feedback and things like that? Because Ultimately, if those things aren't there, the project is not gonna work. And it's not really worth doing even early in your career. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, we have some audience questions I can bring up. Mm -hmm. So Ava asks, within your career, there were a lot of ups and downs. Did you ever 
have, did you ever had uh, some time where you felt like quitting? If yes, how did you get yourself physically and emotionally back in the game? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, certainly there's like a lot of times in a lot of different instances where I felt like I should. And I think it's really important to like sit with the reason why you feel like you want to quit. Um, and I mean, when towards the end of my time at V, I, I really felt like I wanted to quit. And that was like a, a juncture where it definitely made sense because it's like really shit pay at most editorial jobs and living in a city as expensive as New York. Um, it just didn't really make sense anymore. And I also thought that, you know, ultimately I got what I needed out of that experience. And I think that is something that's really important to think about when you're like concluding anything is like, did I get what I needed to out of this? Um, and that was also tricky when I worked at Laird and Partners because I'd only worked there for like three months when I got poached by Eddie. And I just thought like, oh, it's going to look so terrible on my resume that I only worked at this place for three months. And um, I was really getting down on myself about it. But then I was just like, actually, it doesn't really matter. And it doesn't, you know, you don't want to be that person who's like mm -hmm. hopping around every three months to a different place. Um, yeah. But ultimately, Barney's was just a much better fit for me at that time. And so yeah, this is again where it is helpful to have a mentor because they can just like help provide you with that perspective of someone who's like a little more knowledgeable and experienced. Yeah, for sure. That's good to know that, you know, even if you feel maybe kind of trapped in where you are now, there's always potential for something better, you know, down mm -hmm. the road. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. And then and another audience question. Um, what was your biggest learning from your experience B Magazine? How did you turn those negative experiences into creative, inclusive work environments moving forward? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, biggest learning from V Magazine. Um, yeah, I think the biggest learning was definitely just like commenting on like people's weight and like yelling at them and berating them in meetings is not going to get their best work out of them, but it's also just like a terrible way to treat people. Um, and so I think that I then became like hyper aware of what it felt like to be a young designer because you already feel, yeah, it's just like you already feel really vulnerable. You're just like learning about the workplace, learning how to share ideas. Um, and oftentimes like our creative concepts can feel so personal. So I think having compassion and awareness is something that I really try to be mindful of now as a manager and someone in a position of power because ultimately that's what it is in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. So just trying to encourage more like back and forth as well and, and just like ask people about how they feel about their concepts and like which ones they're most excited about and things like that so that there is that trust building that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we were, we were told by someone the other day, one of the speakers said that, you know, if you're not passionate about a project, sometimes it really shows through the work. Like you can mm -hmm. really tell that if someone really enjoyed working on a project versus, you know, not being happy in their environment or in the project that they're in. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question from Chloe. Entering the creative community in Toronto can be intimidating. How did you navigate entering competitive spaces and aligning yourself with like-minded people? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just like a process that slowly evolves, you know, and you just kind of like, I think yeah, I often like like in networking to dating because it is so similar in that you just like you get out, you meet a bunch of people and you just kind of have to see if it vibes or not. Um, and yeah, the, the creative community in Toronto can be admittedly very intimidating, but I think when you're doing work that just feels true to yourself and true to your vision, you also will start to attract like-minded people as well. And I think that we just like also can't be afraid to like reach out to people on IG or just like via email or in person one day when that's allowed again. Um, and just like tell them that you admire their work and why, because I think that actually a lot of like my relationships have started that way. Was there any way that you use to network these days? I know there's like uh, Clubhouse and places like that. Like, would do, do you ever um, participate in things like that, like Clubhouse talks or anything like that? I haven't really done the Clubhouse thing yet, to be honest. I, I don't really get okay. it. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> I've been trying to uh, listen on some things, but yeah, it's super confusing, super new. Um, Jasmine says, love your presentation, Berkeley. You mentioned being a woman of color in a primarily white male dominated industry. Any words of encouragement for women of color facing the same struggles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I think this was like something we touched on a bit um, on Wednesday as well, but I feel mm -hmm. like, yeah, it, it was like pretty painful sometimes, you know, like when, and I think the thing that people don't talk about when you're in an environment that is so pervasively white is that, you know, a lot of people will become like fast friends because they went to like the same summer camps growing up or like they went on the same ski holidays um, and they were on like similar athletic teams and things like that. And there was also just like so much that would happen where I would notice like we worked with certain agencies and like all of my um, white male counterparts would get invited to like parties and socials and things like that. And I wouldn't, and I was just like, okay, there's like very obvious low-key discrimination happening here um but yeah i think it's just like really about staying true to the things that like you value and that you find important in the environment and finding those allies like and those people that will really stand up for you and advocate for your work as well um and i think that's like all you can really do because ultimately you know you're not going to ever like not experience that otherness so it's about finding people who can help validate that experience and like also just be supportive for you yeah i really loved in your talk when you talked about um building your community and like finding your people within in the industry yeah. and i think that that's so important because you know i i tend to feel sometimes that you are alone in it like working for yourself or just freelancing it is quite yeah. daunting being on your own and mm -hmm. having that community to refer to is just such a nice thing to have and yeah, I'm really glad that you touched on that because I feel like it's really important for uh, like young designers to know that they're not alone and you know perhaps their struggles or mistakes or um, mishaps. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to ask uh, one more question unless there's no, there's no audience question, right? Um, you talk about a self-punishing work ethic in your <laughs> in your because <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes I have that as well. You know, I'm taking on so many projects. I just want the experience and I want it in my portfolio and I want the exposure. Yeah. So. How do you navigate and manage your time with this work ethic? And what are some things that you've done along the way to not to make sure you're you know mentally sane when you're doing all of these projects at once? Yeah, I mean, I think I wasn't actually doing a lot to ensure that I was mentally sane before. <laughs> and like didn't have the the healthiest habits now that I realize um like looking back. I mean, I'm definitely someone who would just like overspend and believed in like retail therapy when I was like really stressed mm -hmm. out. Um, I was certainly always very invested in exercise because I think that for me, it helps with my mental health so much. Um, but yeah, I think it's only in more recent years where I just have like reflected and thought, okay, actually, yeah, like it very much is self punishing that kind of work ethic. And I often wonder if it's like, ancestrally inherited because my Chinese grandparents were like that and yeah. I think that I just like I thought that was normal and I thought that's what success looked like um but now I think only yeah quite <laughs> only more recently like maybe in the last year I've realized like oh it's actually like not very healthy for you and that like isn't what success is and I think you really have to like step back and think about what success looks like for you as a person because you know oftentimes I think you can talk to people who are like really financially successful um, successful in a business sense but they might not feel so successful or fulfilled spiritually mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think taking for me, like taking a break halfway through the day and just walking outside for mm -hmm. a second almost makes me better when I come back to work. Yeah. Um, just to like clear your mind and everything and just get a change of perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, you also talk about the fear of failure. Um, you know, early on as designers, I feel like I have that almost every week. Like, what if the client doesn't like this? Or, you know, what if I'm not doing the right job? What if I'm not producing the right logo? Um, was there a turning point in your career where that vanished? Or do you still deal with the fear of failure? Oh God, I definitely do. I mean, like, <laughs> failed on Wednesday when the glitch <laughs> just happened. But like, yeah, I think now I'm just like trying to be so much kinder to myself when those things happen because it's just like, I don't know, it happens. That's life. And mm -hmm. I, 
I remember some like intense moments of failures over or like feeling like they were failures over the years. Um, you know, when we decided that we would like conclude adult or when I moved back from New York, I really struggled with that because I felt like I was being exposed to a lot of like experiences and opportunities there that I might not have in Toronto. And I was like, am I a failure for moving back? Um, but ultimately, it, you know, it just, it felt right for me as a person. And somehow life always does have a way of working out too. And it's like, okay, that door closes, another one opens. And I just truly think that's always the case. Yeah. So beating yourself yeah. up about it definitely is not gonna help any. Yeah, and some things you can't help, right? Like Wednesday, like that was out of our control. So I mean, yeah, that maybe not like getting down on yourself about everything and not taking it personally, I think it's yeah. great too. Mm -hmm. um, how do you remain unstuck during these times? So I know that we're, you know, in lockdown, there's not a lot of inspiration. Oh, blame it on Pandemi Lovato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you uh, cope with, you know, working from home and remaining creatively flowing during this like lockdown? And a lot of us are in these like boxes in the sky. So how do you remain creatively flowing during times like these? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, exercise and like being in nature is so important because I think that it just like helps you refresh and I mean even scientifically you can't reach any kind of like aha moment with creative when you're like intensely focused on it you need you know the mind is more elastic than that and you need some like fl flexibility and air in order to like really arrive at the right creative solutions and ideas and so yeah I think that just kind of like that's why I really appreciate exercise, mindfulness, and just being in nature and that it, it just gives you a little more ease in your work. Um, and I think mm -hmm. something I've returned to during COVID is just like more fun and kind of silly creative exercises, whether it's just like drawing with pencil crayons or doing some little clay sculptures. And um, yeah, I think that can often be the case with like designers, especially it's like we get into these roles because we enjoy being creative. And it's this idea of being creative in your livelihood that's so exciting. And yeah, we can kind of lose sight of that and get like way too serious about, you know, our job, our role, the design concepts, delivering client feedback. So I think it's just like really about remembering to play and have fun. Yeah, that actually ties into my next question about you know you talked about changing the stereotype of the stoner culture and mm -hmm. reimagining the visual language around cannabis and you know changing that narrative and perception and I feel like that's such a bold and amazing thing to do but I feel like as young designers like we're so scared of our big ideas perhaps and like you know not everyone agreeing with us so um how would you uh tell young designers how to navigate an industry that has set narratives perhaps and trying to go into those um, industries that, you know, like you did with um, um, adult magazine, right? Like changing the narrative there too. So what yeah. kind of advice would you give to students that are looking to do something like that? Yeah, so I actually, you know, I do so much writing at the start of a project. And that's something I really encourage my own design team to do before, because like oftentimes I think when we're designers, we'll like get the brief and then immediately start designing, um, which I think, I can admire you if you can do it, but I think that there's like so much conceptual thinking that needs to happen. And I think that truly you need to like cast the net so wide and just like really explore what is really about and what it means to you. And so that's what I meant in like developing your POV on it as well. And so I do a lot of just like free flow writing. I do mind mapping. Um, I gather a lot of like mood imagery and then write in response to that because I think that's how you really start to like reflect and hone in and think about what your approach will be in a really meaningful way. And then I also just find like for myself that all of the visual work that comes out after that just like flows a lot more quickly and easily because that thinking was done. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm a big user of Pinterest. I find that that's like a good place for me to start sometimes, like even just like mind mapping there and you know, getting inspiration from there. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give to someone who's graduating this year on how to navigate the current landscape of design? Oh gosh, I mean, I wish that I had <laughs> a really easy good for this, but it's just like the most difficult time. Um, 
but yeah, I think that in our isolation, things can feel very just like lonely for sure in a lot of ways, just like professionally, personally. Um, but just remembering that there are other people in the creative community out there. So even um, if it's just like messaging a designer on IG whose work you like, or, you know, sending a creative director an email, just kind of like reaching out and not being afraid to do those things. Um, yeah, I think oftentimes designers and especially young designers are, are really afraid to reach out to people they admire or they're afraid they're like bothering someone by doing those things. But it's just nice to kind of get those connections going. And certainly it feels nice for the other person to just like know that their work is resonating with people. Sure. Um, and I think we may have time for one more question. If there's anyone that wants to ask a question in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I'll ask, I know you talked about some invisible parts of your work, like the behind the scenes that we don't see. Um, are there any other parts to your work? I know we see the final result and it's beautiful and amazing and a great solution, but are there any parts of the work that you know are really hard that perhaps designers don't see from the outside looking in um, that do take a lot of emotional labor or physical labor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just like ultimately navigating the, the political workspaces. And that's something that we'll all have to do as designers. Um, but again, that's like why the self care piece is so important. And I think in my time at Tokyo Smoke, I was so burnt out for a lot of it and just like not getting enough sleep because I was just like grinding and working crazy hours and things like that. Um, and then ultimately, you know, when like small annoyances or projects don't go the right way, those things can just like feel a lot bigger and take an even larger emotional toll when you're not taking care of yourself. And so that's why I had that point at the end of radical self-care and radical self-care looks like a lot of different things. It's not just like a sheet mask and a glass of wine, um, but that can be part of it. It's also just like having healthy boundaries with work um, and finding ways to navigate that. And I think that's also just like something that's really hard for women, especially um, because it's so ingrained in us as people to just like constantly be nurturing towards others and to be so giving and selfless. Um, but you really just have to look at, you know, where those healthy boundaries are. So you're not just like totally grinding yourself out, especially not for work. I yeah. It's not worth it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and I think, I think we're running out of time here. Um, I'll just ask one more question. Who have been, or what has been some major influences in your career mm. starting mm. out? Mm. I mean, when I studied in Germany, Ludovic Balland, who is like this really incredible typographer and poster designer, um, he does like really brilliant exhibition and um, and work of that nature, and also a great teacher, um, Edward Leda, as I mentioned. Like, I feel so so lucky to have worked with him and to know him as a person because his work is really brilliant, um, but also just like a really playful spirit and just a great person as well. Um, other sources of inspiration, truly a lot of the designers that were on my Tokyo Smoke creative team as well, just like really good examples of people who were really brilliant thinkers um, and really approaching cannabis in a different way. And again, this is why things like diversity and hiring is so important. You know, not everyone had like the perfect CV when they came to the role. Um, you know, some didn't have like explicit design experience or they didn't have like agency experience. But I think that's like a big facet of diversity is like, you know, ultimately those things are teachable and it's more about how the person thinks and like the passion that they bring to their work. Well, Berkeley, you've been a huge inspiration for me and I'm <laughs> sure everyone listening as well. So thank you so much. And this is gonna be wrapping up our session. Um, so uh, yeah, if there's any, no more questions. No, oh, we're hitting 12.30, Never mind. All right, so thank you so much. And we'd love to see what's happening on your journey next and goodbye everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Great.